This is John, and I can't pronounce your last name. Manischewitz. Oh, thank you. Like Manischewitz. Like Manischewitz. Okay, that, that is good. Okay. Right. I know Manischewitz. Yeah. Anyway, he, he wasn't in here for the room. Who's that? Was disgraceful. He's the head brewer, I guess that's your title, at Third Wave. So, and um, Jerry, who assists John, gave us an all grain demonstration in January, and he's here to talk about sires. So, thank you all for coming. Um, as Sean said, if you sign in so we know who was here that day. If anybody's not getting our emails, we've got an email sign up sheet back there. My wife does periodic constant comments on things like this. So, Anyway, thank you all for coming, and John's brought two beers to taste, and we've got some of ours, which he's going to toss which ones to give you to taste, so. Anyway, John, and this is Tony Russo, who wrote Eastern Shore Beer. If you haven't seen the book, we've got it here. He's here. I think they're already signed if you want a copy, but uh, he's going to be taking it, or whatever you call it these days, recording it. The interweb, live streaming, all over the world. Excellent. So, no problem. Uh, of course. Question they make on please. Yes. No pressure. You can answer. Ask them. Any, 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 any answer. So wonderful. Well, as you might know, I'm the brewer at Third Wave. We've been around for about two and a half years. We're down straight down 13, um, right off of Bi State Boulevard. Um, we took over the old Evo Building. We have plenty of beer. With 14 beers on tap right now. Um, we bought a new cooler, so we definitely can expand our selection. So that way, we have a sour beer on tap at all time now. Uh, right now, it's currently, it's our sour pumpkin, which is one of the ones I brought with me today. Um, sour pumpkin, I'll give you a little bit. Of, it's our pumpkin ale that we brewed, and I threw it into a barrel along with uh, Brett, PDO, and Lacto. Let it sit for a year and a half. Brought it out. It tastes amazing. Um, the pumpkin spices have faded a little bit, but if you're looking for it, you can find it. Uh, if I tell you, like, oh yeah, you pick up the cinnamon and nutmeg in it, you can find them in there if you're looking for them. It's not going to be blown over your top, but the sourness in there is definitely nice and pleasant and smooth. Uh, the other one I brought today is our Tennessee Wild, which is our brown ale that we aged in Jack Daniel bourbon barrels um, with just uh, lacto and a little bit of PDO in there. Um, happened probably within three months of getting sour where that beer is right now. Um, it didn't take long at all for it to get the sour kick to it that it has in there. It's really nice. Um, this is actually one of the very first batches that we pulled off the barrels. It's unblended. It's got a nice flavor to it at all. I've been saving one keg specifically for my purposes, and I brought it out today. Um, so, uh, two books I'm going to recommend. I don't have them here, but you can definitely get them from the Brewers Association. So if you're home brew, um, or part of the Homebrew Association, you can get them there. Once American Sour Beers, and the other one's uh, Wild Brews. Uh, American Sour Beers just came out um, within the last year. Um, Wild Brews is also part of the series with uh, Brew Like a Monk, which Doug has here. Huh? Yeah. So I mentioned Couple words about sour beers or sour bugs, I should say. Uh, the first one's uh, lactobacillus. Um, it is found in yogurt, cheese, sauerkraut, pickles, kimchi, and sourdough bread. Um, it is floating around in the air as we speak right now. Um, it metabolizes the sugars into lactic acids, which lowers the pH, which causes the uh, sourness in the beer. Um, adding that just to the beer takes about about two to three months before you can find out that it actually gets sour. Um, the other one's Pediococcus. It's part of the lactobacilli family and it helps with the fermentation of the sugars. Um, it, uh, it's found in cheese, sauerkraut, and yogurts as well. Um, it, it produces diacetyl, which is a buttery scotch or butter butterscotch flavor comes off of there. So it's a little slickness on your tongue as well um, that's given to the, the sourness to it. Uh, and then the last one is uh, Brettomyces, which is a whole category by itself, which we'll get into in a second. Um, a little bit of history. Sour beers have been around since the day one, since everything's floating in the air. So when beer naturally happened and fermented, it came out and um, most of the beers were probably going to be sour. Uh, we assume that anything that's floating around in the air and fermentation happens, it's because of the Saccharomyces yeast. Could also become part of the Brettomyces yeast that's floating around. Um, 
Lambix, which are one of the Belgian style brews, are part of spontaneous fermentation. Uh, they, the monks, brewed it and or made this beer and let it sit for months on end and produces a sour, dry, cidery finish beer, which is we know now know is all great sour, uh, Flemish red beers from uh, Belgium. Uh, and there's also a goose, which is a blended lambic, which is blended over many years. They sit for up to six years and they blend all the beers together. Um, being a sour, a part of sour beers are one of the great things because they don't require refrigeration. Uh, they don't require, um, had my notes first. There it is. Um, before the advertisement of refrigeration, advances in science and fermentation, um, all beer was varying degrees of sour because of poor sanitation and also understood um, of not knowing about lactobacillus and pediococcus floating around in the air. Um, Bretomyces produces a tartness and sour um, funky characteristic such as leather, smoke, and horse blanket off of uh, Bretomyces. Um, when you have something that says like horse blanket, it's like a barnyard flavor. It's kind of interesting that to have as a weird flavor, but people actually want that flavor in their beer. Um, that's with the, to get those flavors off of Bretomyces, it takes about three to six months to get that um, initial barnyard flavor coming off on there. Um, if you let it go longer, you can also get um, Band-Aid flavor, which most normal beers you don't want in your regular pale ale or IPA, but you'll get in bread and ice, off of bread and ice, these uh, bread brooks. Um, bread lambicus is also another style of bread. Um, it produces a cherry pie fl like flavor. Um, it's not going to taste exactly like the cherries, which is kind of disappointing, but you get that um, the cherry pie filling, that slickness that you get off the tongue. It's interesting. I like it. Yeah. Um, brought some beers if you guys want to sip because I definitely need a drink right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure which one this is because I forgot to label them, so we'll find out together. Take ground and let everybody pour their own. You're not responsible for someone drinking. There we go. So this is our um, sour pumpkin. This is the one that was aged in uh, oak barrels for a year and a half. So right off the top, you can definitely get the, the smell, the nose of it. Definitely get the nice tart finish coming off of there. And as it warms up a little bit more, you can definitely get this um, cinnamon and nutmeg flavors coming off on there. It is quite delicious. Yep. Yeah, we just took our pumpkin ale and just put it right into the barrels. And did you inoculate it after you put it in the barrel? Yeah, I infected it with um, lactobacillus, pediococcus, and red brooks. These are the, one, the barrels, if you're coming to the brewery, these are the barrels that are sitting out in front in the tasting room, just because they're pretty barrels and they don't leak. <laughs> How do you know when it's ready? Do you taste test it all the time? Uh, about every other month I go in and test it. Um, Can you uh, bug me on those days? <laughs> <laughs> the, assist. Uh, the problem is that I have to get the forklift to lift it up in order to get in there. Yeah, it does have the uh, the pins in the back, but the way they the holes work, they usually just dribble down the side. They don't actually just squirt out because everything is gunked up around the, the nail hole in these. So, um, it's, just it's just coming right down the side of yeah. there. I'm just like, eh, it's all over the floor. All right. <laughs> So I actually just take a wine thief, go in there, and pull off a nice sample from us to try and leave them right in. Um, we're going to talk about cleaning real quick, about Brett. Um, it does get into everything. However, if you get a Saison strain or a Belgian strain, it'll eat everything as well. Um, a lot of people say you need to have a separate hose, siphon, um, carboy, specifically for sour beers. As long as your cleaning practices are good and you don't infect your, doesn't, you don't infect your normal beer, you can use the same stuff. Um, however, like if you have your carboy and it's scratched, it's going to sit in there like how any of your other.
uh, yeast and bacteria was going to sit into a scratch. It's hard to get into it. Um, but do you, sorry, do you recommend ahead. any just because I've always been the one telling people that you know it's good to have it's a, a separate sour. You can. But um, is there a cleaner slash sanitizer? I know Star Sand claims to. Uh, as long as you deal with hot water, and we're talking about 180 degrees, which can melt most of the plastics that we're dealing with and above, um, you can definitely kill almost anything. Um, if you let it sit in Star Sand or PBW overnight, you can definitely clean it, um, get in there with a brush and clean it and soak it. Um, it depends on how clean your practices are at home. If you can make beer at home using normal uh, PBW and star sand, you'll be fine. However, the 180 degrees and up is where you come into the issue with the plastics and you can melt them. And I've done it plenty of times at the brewery. What about, um, I know Brett likes to, likes to travel um, during fermentation, any risk of? I always put, um, Sanitizer in my airlocks. Okay. I, don't, I don't use water. Okay. So it doesn't. Okay. From that. Yeah. And just in general. With all, all my um, airlocks have uh, iota 4 or some sort of sanitizer or PBW in there just to keep it clean. Because mm -hmm. it does sometimes go back in. Yeah. Just even though yeah. it's. Yeah. Which is not always fun. So it's a matter of just yeah. developing the right practices yeah. all the time. It's, it, exactly. If you can keep stuff clean, and you'll, be have, you'll be fine doing this at home. Uh, the other thing is you can dedicate a, a carboy to it because you're going to let it sit there for six months to a year. You're just going to let it sit in the corner and forget about it and come back and take a look at it. Uh, you'll know with the bread, it'll start coming, uh, start to produce its flavors within three to six months because you see that layer of pectile over the top of it. It's going to look white. It's going to look funky. It might have some blue and black into it, it's good. Uh, if it starts turning green, then you have some other infection in there. Really? It's mold. Oh. Yeah, green's usually mold. I've had that on beer. That's hot. It's not going to kill you. No. Oh, like kind a, of selling? Yeah. Clean out. When you were making this beer, did you were you waiting for the pumpkin to go away? Not only to go away, but were you waiting for it to be as subtle as it was? Was that part of the plan? I was not part of the plan at all. It kind of disappeared completely off of it. Uh, within about eight months, you couldn't taste any pumpkin to it at all. Uh, after about not after probably about a year, you start to get that pumpkin flavors back into it. Um, when I released it this past year, I actually blended it back with some fresh pumpkin uh -huh. into it to bring up some more of that spices, but it's faded already. Um, now that it's being, um, since I did this, it was back in September when I initially pulled it out of the keg or out of the barrel. Um, I wanted, I kept saying that it was pumpkin spice, pumpkin spice, pumpkin spice. So I was like, I wanted to have that pumpkin spice in there. I was actually going to be fine if it disappeared completely and we called it something different. Mm -hmm. um, that you never make a bad beer. You just call it something else. Where it <laughs> just keep that in mind. <laughs> Um, the way that you did this and the way traditionally it's done, barrels mm -hmm. versus the way a lot of us would do it at home, what's the difference between carboy and a barrel, the outcome of that? Um, doing it at home, it's actually one of the notes I put down, use oak chips. Okay. Um, French oak chips or American oak chips, let it sit in the bottom of the, um, they're going to sit in the bottom anyway. Um, if you want to get a wine character off of it as well, soak them in a, um, Merlot or or Chardonnay with the oak chips. Let it sit there for about a month, then put the oak chips into the carboy with your beer. So you get that oak finish flavor coming off of there as well. Also actually helps with the yeast as well um, to grow. Um, that way it has a, some place to develop all of its flavors. Uh, it was a really cool picture, I meant to bring it in, but I forgot, of a barrel with a clear side on it. And you can just see the yeast growth on, all along the side of the barrel where it's um, in contact with the barrel. It's a really neat picture. I'll see if I can pull it up on my phone later on. Um, that way you can see the yeast growing on it. Um, in the bottom, it's going to be it be fine just floating around. But if you have that oak chips in the bottom, I recommend doing that in general. Now, at would, home. now would you start that in the beginning? Or? Uh, I usually do this in secondary fermentation. So you let your beer go primary, whatever you do. Uh, if you're going to be just doing a lambic style beer, uh, low ABV, low IBUs, under 10, 
uh, use old hops. Um, they say use the cheesy three-year-old hops because they still have the principles in there to go ahead and um, be the antiseptic quality to make the beer last so it doesn't spoil. Um, uh, that's I've gotten hops from here before that are quite cheesy. That I uh, yeah, you should have a good uh, you should have a good backlog. I do, especially on the leaf ones. I just dropped yep, off. Yeah, I'm excited to go ahead and use those. Found out really quickly like nobody wants to buy leaf hops, so we started opening them up, and I'm like, oh boy. If I give you a four pounds of it four, it was, four pounds of leaf. That's not bad. Funny story. Boy's like, let's go. We had we just got a new Randall in. I'm like, all right, cool. She's like, well, we have those leaf hops that Doug just gave us. I'm like, all right, cool. Go grab them and see what they taste like. <laughs> and knowing full well that they were completely bad, she's like, they're not good. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I found out why on a couple of them. When somebody punched the holes to hang them. They uh, punched them below the CO2. seal level, <laughs> which makes the bag go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that way you don't Enjoy those. Yeah. I expect hours from that. that you're rolling yeah. about a year and a half now. Okay. Hey, I got it. <laughs> I got? We have uh, four barrels outside. We have four. We have ten barrels total of sour beer production right now. Uh, these are 53 gallon, um, well, 59 gallon wine barrels. I have six of those, and then I have 53 gallon um, bourbon barrels. So we got quite a few barrels going on right now that will slowly start to develop flavor. Uh, the Tennessee Wild Barrel now has a sour saison going in there, um, which has been in there since July, which is going to taste really good this summer, which is going to be one of the new ones we're going to come out with. Um, I'm trying to talk Lori into bottling these so we can actually bring them out to more people so you guys can take them home and age them, which would be awesome. We'll see. Um, but right now they're draft only. Um, we did a really good one with a raspberry lambic, um, 42 pounds of raspberries in the in the barrel. Um, the last keg actually just went to Baltimore on Monday to Max's Tap House um, for their sour beer day, and it got great reviews when people were there. Uh, the other one we brought from Max's was our Tennessee Wild, which is one of my favorites. Um, vanilla beans, oak chips, or vanilla beans, toasted coconut, and the oak. And then you also get some of that jack flavor coming off in barrels as well. It is a lot of complex flavor in this hour. Um, do you guys have questions at all about this? I was going to just tell real quick. Yeah. Not as the sour. So if anybody wants something that's not beer, I have bottles of water as well. If you guys want something. But. There's still more of that pumpkin. So if you guys want some more of that, pass it back around. Sour water. Yes. Sour water. Yep. Uh -huh. Like that water. Yeah, what about? Uh, oxygen, like oxygen versus uh, you, definitely, versus you definitely want oxygen introduced into it. Yeah. Um, it. You will definitely get a better um, production, especially with Brett. It's going to start to happen quicker. Um, it's going to get that sourness come off quicker in the first initial months. Um, you let it sit a little bit longer, it's going to blend and mellow with the flavors. Um, but definitely when you're transferring it, Dump it if you can vigorously, um, so you get plenty of oxygen into it. Um, one great thing about being in a barrel, a lot of oxygen going in and out of it. Uh, it's not to the point where you're going to get the cardboard oxygenated or um, cardboard flavor coming off of it. That it's going to be too papery or anything like that. When you get your normal beers, that you, your paler or IPA or porter that you get, um, I want to say it's kind of disguised to some sort of degree with the sourness in the beer. Um, now the second one that you're going, this one's going around again, it's warmed up a little bit more, you get a little bit more flavor, because that last sip that I just taped had a lot more tartness to it. Um, and there's plenty. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was actually jealous of him at first, because I'm like, oh, he's at the end, he can, he can boldly pull. <laughs> <laughs> and then when it's starting to come back, I'm like, ah, now, now I'm <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably gonna go into it already, but um, primary to secondary fermentation. Um, do you do you add the bugs to primary, or do you ferment with a regular yeast primary and then sour? We can do both. You can do a hundred percent bread fermentation. I've done it before on an IPA. It's kind of interesting. It's pretty cool actually to get 
the sourness and then the IPA bitterness and the, um, the sourness and the uh, bitterness and the, the, the aromas that come off of it. Kind of a mind meld type of thing that you just completely, yeah. Uh, it is quite tasty. Going off of that though, I mean, any insight on like some of the quick souring techniques here about you can, like you, uh, kettle souring? You can do it with uh, lacto bacillus. Yeah. Definitely, it's a quick sour. Because I mean, I've seen a couple methods of you know somebody instead of doing saccharomyces originally, you know, keeping it at 110 degrees, 100. You can definitely put it in the mash, um, let it go. Um, we do a Berliner Weiss, which is a sour beer. Uh, we use uh, lactic acid in the boil, 88% lactic acid into the boil. I don't can't tell you the percentage because I don't remember off the top of my head, but. Uh, we have a Berliner Weiss ready in three weeks. Yeah. Uh, you also do a sour mash, per yeah. se, like you could... You do a, a mash, let it sit for the weekend, and then come back on Monday. Uncrushed. Too grain. Yep. Because the uh, lacto. lacto is floating around in there. It's on the grain itself. Um, it's also on fruit skins as well. So if you throw peaches in there, the peach skins on there, you get that little bit of sourness as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I say peach because they're the ones that can actually get the Delaware native ale from dogfish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's where they got their yeast. You ever seen where they got that from? Peaches. Yeah, it wasn't just peaches sitting on a tree. It was peaches on the ground. ground. Yeah. yeah. Rotten pile yep. of peaches. Gross. But, uh, what are we doing that beard yeast? <laughs> hey, we do. We can do it. <laughs> I won't have as much as he did, but you know, I haven't worked in a brewery for 27 years either, so. But see, the, the DNA yeast is actually, uh, there's no bugs. There's no lack of that either. Mm -hmm. They just pull the That's just the saccharide. Yeah, they just saccharide yeah. strain out of it. And they can do it because they have a nice lab. Yeah. 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 And it also took a while, a long time to find it and build that yeast because they found like one viable strain. It's still worse than native ale. It's like 87% like chicken poop. <laughs> <laughs> If you wanted to, you were you were talking earlier about soaking the uh, oak chips in wine. How long would you do that? Um, two to four weeks. That way, it, it soaks up in, in there, and you get oh. that wine character. So you should soak the uh, oak chips in wine for two to four weeks before you do the beer. Correct. Well, do it during primary. So then, when you add the, to the add your bugs, At the same to the time you're yep, and you added the, your bugs to the secondary, throwing your oak chips to it as well. At that point, uh, no preference as far as chips versus cubes versus spirals, or um, whichever gives you the most surface area. Sp spirals work great because there is a lot of it. Um, I find that oak chips work better for getting it out of a carboy itself because um, the spirals, even though it's the same size, it's kind of fun trying to get a spiral out of a carboy. Mm -hmm. One cool thing about a spiral, though, and I'm sure you guys have done it, is that once you get your big funky batch going on, and it is you can just pick him up. Yep. Drop him into another one, it'll go. Like yeah, if you're doing it in a bucket, it's going to be easy to do it, but if you're doing it in a glass carboy, it's hard to, to pull yeah. that spiral out. Um, one trick you can do is take a piece of fish wire wire and hang it outside of the carboy and put the plug down. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I just realized after that we've had it for a year, I had cedar. I actually had pulled them back for myself because. Cedar IPA sounds great. That sounds delicious. Even because I thought cedar was toxic, and apparently it is, but Spanish cedar isn't. Okay. Sorry. That's so a little tough one. Yeah, we'll go for it. Uh, so, That's true. That's true. so you can make sour beers at home really quickly using uh, lactic acid and uh, lactobacillus, and you can get it within two months. You can have a sour beer. Um, Lacto acid or sour mash, you can get a Berliner Weiss turned over quickly. Um, when we did ours, we had we just did ours with uh, American Chico yeast as our house strain, Rolo beer, um, wheat pilsen malt, and cranked it out. It was ridiculous on how much grain we put into a ten barrel batch. Um, by ridiculous, I mean it wasn't that much. It was a third of what we normally did. It was a two and a half percent beer, and I turned it out, and I'm like. Where's the rest of it? And like it was, we were graining out within two hours of you know mashing in, and it was no time at all. The um, if you do the lactic acid, that's the knee of the Berliner thing, right? Correct. It's it's a, it's a quick turn. That's what um, 
Dolphins does with Justino, right? Okay. Um, they also add peaches to it, too, to hide some flavors and do some things up. I think your guys is a lot. Tastes more like a true salad versus a. I've learned along the ways. Yeah. <laughs> also, Dogfish is trying to produce to a mass market of trying to put this beer out and trying to. It's not a brew pole exclusive, so you don't want to reach a limited crowd. They're trying to get everybody to enjoy it, mm -hmm. which I can drink plenty of cases in the summer of that beer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, do you taste the difference between a lactic ferment versus adding a lactic acid? Um, personally, no. I don't have that palate to go ahead and distinguish. Uh, my palate is um, unique that I cannot taste the acid all at all. No butter. So you drown the popcorn at the theater, don't you? I can. <laughs> it's like swishing around. Yep, it's fun. Sean picks it up in two seconds. And I'm not. And I'm not even that picky on it. Yeah. A friend of mine, he, he tasted one of, beer, one of my beers I was proud of. He's like, did I ask so much? I'm like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Fred in the fields. Yeah. Easy cheesy. Yeah. But yeah. Now, would you suggest Brent to clean it up at all? Or? For, for guys, uh, you can if you you can if you have time. I mean, home brewer, yes, you can easily do it and have time and be like, all right, time to move on to the next one. Um, pro, it's we have expectations of beer coming out, and you can only let it sit for however long. When you say something's going to be out this at this time, do you expect it to be done? Um, there are tricks of the trade that I can go ahead and try to blend other beers to go ahead and try to cover that up and. Um, so it's not as noticeable or blend two batches together one that's ready one that's not ready blend them together so that way you get that uh to, for those flavors to come um where you want it to be um there's a lot of blending going on with sours um new belgium has a specific department um thousand barrel fooders that are ridiculously awesome and i was there in october and I'm like, can I come work for you? He's like, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was actually talking about it earlier today. Um, Dutch is Dutch is big more. Um, whatever you want to call it. Yep. Uh, I speak Eastern Shore, so I can't say that word. Um, but they, when they do theirs, they take a, they make two batches. They put one in Borgone barrels, one not, and then they blend mm -hmm. to taste before they bottle it on all of them. And the inconsistencies of that beer are mind boggling. I've had some that tasted like straight vinegar. Yep. And I can't stand that beer because of that initial outcome of that. I've had ones that taste like a bag of sweet and low. And I've had ones that taste like you're chewing on oak. But that's, um, that's part of the game with sours. Yep. And then you also look at um, the traditional lambics, like Frambois, the raspberry lambic. It is supposed to be a sour beer, uh, it is not as sweet. But that's the way they designed the Lindemans designed that beer to be. Um, traditionally, if you say it's a lambic, it's you expect that dry, cidery tartness to it. Um, but the Lindemans use fruity. They want the fruit aspect of it, the fruity way of doing it. Um, with our raspberry lambic, it's supposed to be a frambois. I didn't want to confuse it with Lindemans. So that's why I just called it straight up raspberry lambic. So that way you can go ahead and get the lambic flavor, the tartness to it, and with the raspberry finish in it. Also, it's got a nice little purple color to it, being in the raspberries. So, questions, comments? Is the raspberry lambic, you said that's the summertime one? The, uh, that was a limited quantity. I just sent the last keg over to Baltimore. Um, we will be releasing, that's in the barrels right now, a peach lambic. Uh, we had leftover peaches from when we did our peach wheat last last uh, summer. So we put that into the barrels. Um, I'm gonna need the exact date and time of release. <laughs> that. that was, went in there in July and I have yet to taste it. So I will invite you over to taste that one. Yes. Uh, also in there, I have a watermelon lambic. Um, we call it pucker up. Um, Cause it's supposed to taste like the sour patch kid watermelon. Uh, we released it once. Um, and then I put more watermelon um, into it because I have free watermelon from my farmer. It's a great thing about working, having to deal with your farmers. You get some fruit stuff, such as pallets of watermelon that the farmers can't use. When I say pallets, I meant pallets of watermelon, and they're 700-pound pallets. And a lot of watermelon to cut. 
that's a fun day at work, isn't it? It's a nine, ten hour shift of cutting up watermelons. Ugh. Now, just um, I don't want to get too 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 much off, but yeah. the, the, the sours are, are better for watermelon because you did the one watermelon beer, the straight watermelon, which which isn't the same by by any stretch as the yeah. sour. The, the watermelon, you're gonna definitely get more of that sweet and sour tartness to it that I was looking for with the Sour Patch Kids. Right. That's what I was looking for in that beer. Uh, peach, you're not going to get as much sweetness off of it, but you're going to get that peach flavor coming through on it. Um, the Sour Saison definitely is a sour blonde. Um, it is quite nice already, and that's already sent a firkin of that all the way up to Two Stones uh, for one of their events, and it went over really well. Um, so I'm going to be pulling that one out soon and replacing, try to fill that up again, make another Saison, pour it back into that, do that one again. Also, in my hidden collection, I have a Flemish Red that's been sitting for two years. That's originally started as a homebrew, five-gallon batch, just to get the yeast propped up on it. Um, that was one of the very first sour beers I did at Third Wave, and it still has yet to come out at all to market because I'm not ready for it to be ready to be bottled yet. Or it's a it? What's that? Tasted it? No, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Two years is a long time. I'll be glad to help you with that again. Too. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's here's what I'm afraid of. I'm gonna be disappointed that it's not gonna be a sour as, as amazing as I can, I'm hoping it's yeah, gonna be. Push, push it. Uh, Rosalie. Yeah. It's, it's that's what I'm looking for. Yes. But I'm hoping for that. So we'll see. All right, let's go back to these notes. Uh, initial fermentation for doing your homebrew batch. Uh, temps looking in mid 70s, so we want to pitch it warm. So not necessarily leave it by the heater, but leave it in definitely in a warm room, primary fermentation. Let it finish out as much as possible. And then when you go into your secondary, pitch it in the low 60s. Uh, transfer, keep it in the 60s. That way it still produces uh, with the, the bread and the lacto and the PDO in there. Um, so that way it still produces. If you go too low, 50s, 40s, it's just going to go dormant and flip to the bottom and not do anything at all. Um, I meant to bring my growler of tregs that I keep bringing with me. So I drink a lot of sour beers at home. So I just pour off the tregs in there and pour them into a one-gallon cardboard. It is quite disgusting. That's going to go. <laughs> well, I was going to say, that's going to go. The hands down funkiest growler ever. It is quite funky, and I looked at it. Yesterday and I'm like, all right, I meant to bring it, and it's still sitting on my bathroom counter. I'm like, shoot, is that just for display purposes? Or no, that's what that's gonna be my house culture when I get back into doing homebrews again. That way, I have, I have this is everything that's been collecting from all the other great breweries that make sour beers. You take that last inch, yeah, you're not drinking it, but you're gonna swirl around, dump it right into it. So you get your collection of sours. Yeah, it's gonna have some Saccharomyces regular yeast in it. But it's also going to have all their house bread, so you don't know exactly what's in it. But it yeah, but it, <laughs> exactly. That's what you want. You don't have to pitch it at all. You can still that's your house yeast, no matter what you do with it. But then you can go ahead and blend your lacto, add more lacto to it to get the sour tartness to it to get that turned over quicker. Does she mash any higher? No, regular regular so homebrew. Okay. Um, do you want it? Do you want it to finish? You know, 10, 12, 12, 10, 16, uh, and then let it keep going. Um, when you're done with brewing, uh, make sure it's like 10, 4, 10, 4 to 10, 6, 10, 8. Uh, you want it to be dry. You want it to be real dry. Uh, also, if you have a chance, if you can filter it, or if you're bottling it, make sure you pull it off of well above that yeah. line, otherwise it's going to keep fermenting in the bottle. And then you have bottle bombs. Huh. Uh, if you put it in a keg, not a problem. Yeah. You can control that. But if you put it in bottles, just go ahead and redo it. Make sure you either, one, either drink it fresh-ish. I mean, what, what was going on that? Bottling. What? What? Where am I at? Um, so, Fun. are you talking about any? No, I mean, any of the bright beers, because it still will keep eating it in there. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Make sure it's finished like, down to 10.04, 10.06, 10.08 mm -hmm. before you bottle it. Um, make sure, obviously, you're letting it sit there for a year, and if we're pulling it off, make sure you pull low off that yeast trub. Even after 
year, two years, is it still safe to bottle? You can still bottle it, yeah. It's not a problem to bottle. It's when you drink it and after it's bottled, make sure you either keep it cold, otherwise it still is going to keep fermenting in the glass mm -hmm. and explode. Is that why most of them are champagne bottles? Mm-hmm. And geysers? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, or champagne bottles in general because they can hold the pressure. Yeah, too. Cage. yeah. Um, but if you're just doing it at home with normal capping, I either yeah, put them in the fridge right away, put them in the basement floor where it's usually a, a cool temperature so the yeast can definitely settle out, or drink them fresh because I've actually had experiences of glass bottles exploding in the kitchen and going all the way to the family room, which is about from here to the window out there. And yeah, it's not fun trying to pick up glass. Yeah. Um, but definitely drink it as soon as you're ready, drink them. Keep them one or two in the back of the fridge for prosperity, but it's and good. This uh, bottle conditioning time, is it long with um, sour beers or is it just yeah, about the same? About, about two or three weeks. Okay, so it's about the same. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it depends on how much. It still has yeast in it. It's still adding more sugar to it so for that yeast to eat. There's still saccharomyces still floating around in there. So it's it's, definitely is it still in suspension? Or do you got to have to, when you're a rack and kind of get down into the tree? It's still, it's still going to be in suspension. Okay, cool. I was going yeah. to follow one. I don't know, so I was curious. Yeah. Want to pass out some of your beers? Yeah. Um, you want to hear like stops? Raise your hand. Awesome. So we'll get a non-hoppy beer. Right back. All right. Um, going to the secondary, if you can add oxygen, if you have an oxygenator, definitely be a great to boost start getting that bright, start working. Um, there's smack packs from uh, WE East or White Labs also has them. Doug does not carry the bugs here anymore, but he can order them for you. Uh, or you can order them online as well. Um, now, when you were saying you 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 were saying that you store the dregs, if you wanted to just just is this any harder or any easier to cultivate than like a, a regular yeast? If you want to, you're keep looking using at it? time. Yeah, because for it to keep propagating, you're looking three to six months for that yeast to start being fully active. For that, especially with the bread, it's uh -huh. going to take a while for that to pick up again. So you don't want to let that sit and let that go for a while. It's not like, oh, I'm pitching it two weeks later. I'm going to use it in my homebrew. Uh, so I've been saving these for a couple of years now. <laughs> so. But if, if, so, for instance, if I plan on doing several batches over the course of several weeks, I would, I would plan on grabbing some, not trying to propagate it myself because it would take longer than I wanted. Yes. Yeah, definitely. You can... Uh, a normal punch that you get will be more than enough to do a couple of batches. Oh, all right. When you uh, add lactic um, to your uh, Berliner Weiss, mm -hmm. you add just to taste or do you go to pH? Or? Uh, you definitely can do pH. Uh, I have a recipe that's tried and true that I've been using for a couple of years now that will give you, that gives me exactly what it is. So I know for a 10 barrel batch how much how many milliliters I'm supposed to add to sure. it. Um, Start with the taste. Obviously, go low because you can't take it out once it's in there. Mm -hmm. um, I know a couple of breweries around here that are experimenting with Berliners with lactic acid, and some are barely sour, and some are ridiculously sour. Um, so it's always you know better to go low, but you can always add it later on. Uh, I add mine in the boil, so that way it's all mixed up and everything in there. So it's definitely going to take effect. Um, you're not adding much to it. You're, you're, I'm going to throw a number out there, but don't quote me on this. Uh, it's like 30 milliliters. For five gallons. Five gallon. For Berliner, for acting like the acid. So you're adding not a whole lot to start with, and then you go from there to see how. You, and it it's all depends on your palate as well, what you want to make. Sure. What you like may not necessarily be what any of your friends like. Heads up, guys. It's uh, Ginger Six on. Uh, it's crazy fresh brew the week and a half ago. Okay, today. A little foamy. Um, probably not even that cold right now, but. What'd you use for ginger? Candy ginger. 
Question about the lactic acid. Yeah. Uh, will the by adding lactic acid, uh, will the pH levels affect the yeast at all? Uh, During fermentation, it did not for mine. That's going to be a low pH. You know, definitely lower the pH quite a bit. Um, you're looking about in the three and a half to four for pH, which is really low. Um, I didn't see any effects with my house yeast. Um, however, I did not use that. I did not repitch that yeast. Okay, so stressed. I, I would say, yeah. Um, is it? It finished before I want it to be. I mean, you're, you're dealing with a low. You're looking at 1034 to start with, 1032 to start with. Okay. So that's, and it went down to get me 2.5% alcohol. Yeah, is it something that um, if you were to do a higher AUV, um, which means I know it wouldn't be to style, but would it be worth it on a starter just for security purposes? You could. Um, if you're doing dry packets, use two packets. Um, using the liquid pitch, as long, looking at the code on it, you might be able to get away with a liquid pitch just because they're usually a higher cell count in there. Um, in liquid versus, really? Vice versa. Did I flip that? Yeah. yeah. Um, dry packets normally contain 50 to 75% more viable yeast than one liquid. Um, at least White Labs. White Labs is, um, they recommend a starter. For anything under ten forty five or anything ten forty five and that's, above. That's really long. Yeah. So you're great for your uh, Okay. I'll be fine for the Berlin. I thought it was ten sixty for uh, at least on their website. Okay. Now, that being said, you could probably get up to ten sixty easy. And I know like oh ninety things like that will shoot through the glass and it got to <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's scary. Awesome. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, according according to White Lab, uh, ten forty five and below is what their pitchable yeast is. You know, <laughs> why yeast on the other hand? You're basically making a mini starter. I don't know, frankly. I wonder that myself. <laughs> <laughs> no question, Miss Siri. Siri <laughs> sure doesn't know either. Um, so, talking about some of the great sour beers starting in, uh, in Belgium was Cantillon, probably one of the hardest and most hard to find. When I was at Max's on Monday, they were selling bottles. Of one bottle, I forget which style it was, but it was $60 a bottle. And that you can easily turn that around to a $200 bottle online if you decide to trade it. Wait, was it uh, months? Um, and Cantillon has been doing this since 1900. They've been making sour beers for a long time, so they have a little bit of knowledge on how to make great sour beers. Uh, other great beers that in the area that make uh, sour is uh, Jolly Pumpkin out of Michigan. Funny enough, they only make one pumpkin beer. And they only made it within the last few years recently. But, um, it makes some really good sours, and I've had my privilege of drinking plenty of those over the years. Have they started distributing again here? No. I know they pulled them out of uh, Delaware. Yes, you can find it in Delaware. Yeah, in Maryland, they were there, and then they pulled it out of them. I, I've seen it. Uh, in Atlantic Liquors in Rehoboth. Uh, they don't have a whole lot there, but you can find, definitely find two or three bottles of the same. Yeah. All their beers? Sour. They are? Yes. Um, Lost Abbey and Russian River out in California. Uh, those are... Uh, Russian River has a great IPA. And they also do some really good sours as well. It has a... Consecration, a, a shun yeah. at the end of it. Consecration, supplication, resurrection. Uh, resurrection. Um, a newer brewery out in Denver uh, is Crooked Stave. Um, all he does is sour beers, and you can definitely um, find him in Baltimore or in Maryland area. Um, <clears throat> not, I don't think you can find him in Delaware yet, but he makes some, Chad makes some really good sour beers over there. I'll, only does sours. When you go to the tasting room, you order a beer, you only get a five ounce pour of it. Uh, and you're paying the price for a five ounce pour. You can buy bottles of them. They're only 375 milliliters. Most of them are. And he uh, can charge whatever he wants because he gets it. Makes some really, really good beers. Um, randomly, Miller Coors has a division called AC Golden, uh, which does Nothing but sour beers and random one-off beers. Um, 
So being such a big corporation as Molecores, they do have a separate division. They didn't buy it, they made it themselves. Um, and they had a really good peach lambic that got me started making our fruit lambics. Uh, I met him out, I forget what the guy's name is, out in GEVF a couple of years ago. And he had a conference uh, session on it. And it was quite interesting to learn that Coors has a sour division. Try to get into our market. <coughs> um, uh, Deschutes also has a sour beer uh, out in um, Oregon, Bend, Oregon. Um, it's a sour ale apothecary series, um, which is in fermenting in hollowed out spruce trees, resembling dugout canoes. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'm so Why not? Yeah. Who is this again? Deschutes. I'm on it. At this time of when I got this article, it was tenth. It was the fifth largest brewery in the country. Really? Um, Hill Farmstead uh, out in Vermont makes some really good beers as well, but they also have some really good sours. Um, what he does is make them extremely rare and limited, so they can create demand for it. Um, so you have to go there, up there, to buy it. You at the just uh, at the uh, brewery. You can't buy them out in public. You can't sell them online, and you can see them trading quite a bit for a pretty penny. If you guys, anybody goes to get health farm, so please remember Sean. Yes, <laughs> I'll give you money. Um, uh, That's towards the beginning again. I think that was it for what I had. No, it wasn't really a huge presentation. No PowerPoints or song and dance to it. There's still time. I know. So if anyone wants to start dancing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm going to pass out another beer right now if you guys are up for it. Sure. It's our Tennessee Wild Ale. Sour brown aged in jack barrels with um, bread, or not, not with bread, it's with uh, PDO and lacto in here. Um, you get toasted coconut, you get the burnt wood from the barrels, you get vanilla, uh, vanilla beans as well. Um, also, you get some of that jack flavor as it warms up, and it's sitting right nice and pretty right now where the temperature it's at, so you definitely get some of that jack character coming off of it. Brett Traw and Brett Clasini, which is one of the ones in there. Have you used that much? Um, interesting fact about Brett Clausini, it was Clausen who found it, which is also the founder of Clausen Pickles. Really? Yep. Huh. 1900 something time around there so he found that yeast to help with making the sourness in his pickles okay so it gives more tart as opposed to the pulp that you get from broth correct and lambicus is more the, the cherry pie flavor um rock brick brooks is going to be the very number one that you find around you can definitely experiment with all three and try to do taste tests between all three um main ones from brett because uh, there's also Brett Brooks, Brett Clausen, uh, Brett Lambicus, and uh, Brett Dre for that, Dre Fontaine. That's the T R O I S. It could be, yeah. Um, it, I thought that was a blend of all three. That the Twa is. Oh, okay. So that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Um, there's a lot more out there. Um, within the Brett Brettomyces family, there's about 19 strands. That are available that you can get your hands on but you can't so with this one you don't get that over pucker to it because it doesn't have a lot of pdo in there it's mostly lacto that you can taste in this um there's no bright in this at all um you just get what's off that wood what's off the uh, vanilla beans and the uh, toasted coconut um and this was in the barrel for about three months the um Do's and don'ts. Um, <clears throat> like I said, you want to make a flush, like a long-term lambic. Keep it clean. Start start clean like you would do any other home brew. Uh, if you wanted to a long-term one, put it in the corner. Find a fermenter, not an old fermenter, but don't definitely give away your brand new one. 
Uh, you can definitely dedicate your old one that has scratches in it. Put some wood chips in the bottom of it. And let it go for a year. Forget about it. Keep an eye on that airlock. Make sure it's always full so it doesn't like actually float around your house or apartment. Um, when I did mine at my apartment, I left it underneath the bathroom sink because it never. It was always dark. Temperature was pretty much constant. Um, and, I, don't about, I don't know about your house, but. Uh, uh, but I had plenty enough room to put a couple one gallon um, fermenters underneath my sink because it fit underneath the, the drain pipes. Um, I want to put a five gallon bucket on there because it wouldn't fit, otherwise, I wouldn't be able to use anything that was there. But it was out of the way, forgot about it, didn't definitely need to touch it pull it out and disturb it it wasn't going to get affected by light or anything like that like you would with your normal beers like i said the temperature was always constant so i didn't have to worry about that too let it go for a year pulled it out it was probably some of the best tasting beer that i ever made um took those tregs off of there and we you know we pitched right on top of it good idea to split a batch definitely one gallon of course because of the time um living in an apartment 1100 square foot apartment for two people um it was plenty of space to do a five gallon batch, but I didn't feel like taking up the, the whole kitchen. Um, for doing one gallon batches, it was easy. I could do three one gallon batches in an afternoon and split them all up and put them all away. And it was easy cleanup, personally. Are um, oak the whole time? Uh, Sorry, I, I, I'll ask you specifically more talking about blemishes because that's going to be probably my next rule. Go for it. Um, I prefer oak. I did French oak with the one that we have in the brewery. Um, for the initial starter, French oak chips, uh, red wine. I forget which wine it was. It was a $10 bottle that I drank the rest of. So <laughs> you buy a, a cup of wood chips, two cups of wine, and just let it go. I've heard um, some folks will do a five-gallon batch, or do 10, um, do five with oak, five with not, and then blend is that a Definitely. recommendation? No, that's personal preference. Okay, so if you want more tannins, you go straight up. If you yeah. Want less. So it, also with doing adding the wine to it, you actually cut back some of those tannins. Okay. Uh, you, it pulls them off a little bit, so that way it's not straight oak character into mm -hmm. it. Uh, also, I like adding the Merlot or Chardonnay flavor to the, the beer, so you get that extra dimension to the flavor as well. Um, with the um, not with these. Um, one of the ones I did, you can actually taste the Chardonnay or the, and the Merlot off the different ones, off the different barrels that we used. Um, you can definitely experiment with the one gallon, mm -hmm. half. What's well, so oh, I mean, you do a yeah. five gallon batch, split it to five one gallons, and do it different. Right, have five different beers. One, you know. And the great thing about that, if you're kegging, you can blend them all back together. Yeah. And you have a rather unique beer at that point. Um, you just got to remember that it's, you're looking at at least six months if you're using Brett, if not a year to a year and a half. Uh, using just straight lacto, you can have a beer turned out within two months, which is what you're going to get with this uh, Tennessee Wild here. P.O. Never buy something, right? I wouldn't. It's not going to – it adds to the lacto. It's um, more aggressive, isn't it? Uh, it it'll, it'll, it'll tolerate it'll the toler pH and higher gravity. Um, you just start in low gravity to begin with, lower gravity to begin with, um, but it adds, it boosts the lacto or lactobacillus in it. Um, I've never done PDO by itself. That's huge deep on. Yeah. Like it's you, you, incredibly diacetyl. So it, by blending in all three, right, PDO and lacto, you can. What's well, what I'm saying? Yeah. That you want to, in that case, would you want to go with a bread? You know, to kind of clean things yes. up after the fact. Yes. To, uh, so you're going to get so lacto is in two to three months. PDO is within four to six months, and then bread full character within eight to twelve months. So with all three combined, you can definitely um, make a clean a clean beer. I've heard, and I don't know if it's true, I've heard that bread will eat diacetyl. Yeah, that's what it is. yeah. It, apparently, Brett wheat. Anything. Yeah, it eats all the sugar, produces alcohol, eats diacetyl next, and then when that's all said and done, it'll actually start to consume alcohol again. I don't know what it produces from eating alcohol, but <laughs> I don't know. It's a, black, a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes away. 
how do you how do you can keep a beer like this consistent because you were you, you have to taste it till it's ready so you just have to remember what it tastes like you, you keep, constantly taste test you pull off old kegs um, that's you you keep the like you tasted the last batch to know when this one was ready this is the first batch so this is how <laughs> it's gonna start so this is the very first one that we did with it because i did two oh. batches of, oh, oh all right because <laughs> so, it tastes exactly the same to me I yeah this is the very first batch that we did so um and we just t um we have four barrels at the time when i did oh. this so pulled off two and then pulled them off again and refilled them up again and let it just keep going um with the barrels it's great so i don't have to repitch into it because it's already in there adding fresh wort to it it's just going to start fermentation over again um if you're doing it at home you can definitely boost it again and have another pitch snack packs are seven dollars so they're not ridiculously expensive trying to get a pitch for a 10 barrel batch you're looking three hundred dollars so it's better it's, it's better to go ahead and reuse the yeast as much as possible if anyone wants to use rosalair you guys gotta give me when you get it from me, you gotta give me at least a week's lead time because we don't stock it. It's, yeah. It's only released once a year by Wise, but it's the shit. If you want to make a um, Flemish or Flanders style beer, um, yep. uh, well. there's one other yeast I'm gonna look it up right now. Um, <clears throat> also, you can't culture Duchess bottles. It's. Um, or pasteurized before they go in the bottle and the yeast is dead. Just saying. Don't try pulling dregs off of that. What's the name? They wrote the American Sour Beers. Has a list of all the stuff you can culture. Mm -hmm. you, know, you keep your one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if, I think, you know, I'm not sure. I think regular Rodenbach is dead. Um, I think Grand Cru you can pull some dregs, but I'm not positive. Actually, that's something else. If you guys are looking for something, if you've never had a Flemish. And you want something that's commercially available for Rodenbach. First, I think Rodenbach regular sucks. Grand Cru is amazing. Grand Cru is delicious. Grand Cru is amazing. But you can find it. Um, but, it seems like every other There's nothing about that that's bad. Except for the fact it's a Oh! Oh! No, I'll take two. <laughs> yes. That's how um, it was when uh, I was in Philly. They had. Find the elder on tap. I was like, I'll take five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, Wild Yeast makes a strain called it's uh, 3278 Belgian Lambic blend. So if you're thinking about doing uh, Belgian style or Lambic style beers um, without using lactic or without using lactic acid, uh, this strain has a Belgian ale strain, a sherry strain, two Brett strains, lactobacillus, and pediococcus strain, all in one pack. So it's a snack pack. Mm -hmm. I've used it before. I like using it um, because you can have all everything in there that you would want for a starter without having to buy lacto, pedio, and brett, your brett blend, as well as your sacro, uh, saccharomyces blend for your, your original start. You just pour this in right in primary. Have you ever used uh, White Labs Belgian Sour Blend? I, I have I've either. mostly I have used uh, snack packs for the. Yeah. Okay. I have Belgian sour blend. I don't know much about it. I I've had really or had customers that have had really good luck with the the bread trough, mm -hmm. all three blends together. Um, there's also Flemish ale blend at White Labs, yes. Blend, which is crazy if you ever look in a vial. You know, you get a vial of yeast, and there's like that much in it. When you get a vial of bugs, it's like a thin silt. Yeah, you you have that much. Of yeah, for the, for the bugs, you don't have a lot, and, it, it doesn't it, take a lot to, to it pour it, yeah. So, that's the great thing about with that, um, that blend pack that I said, it, you can definitely just have to pitch that one, and that's it. So, this is supposed to go to four, so I'll stay here till four. Until <laughs> <laughs> Another quick question about about a third wave. Yeah. I uh, I was fortunate enough last year they had the uh, yeah the Berliner Weiss and the uh, and that uh, Old Bay Amber, mm -hmm. and someone suggested mixing them together, and I did, and it was fantastic. So is you were talking about blending beers before, and mm -hmm. Ed who comes here a lot, he's mm -hmm. he's he's very big into blending beers. Is there any kind of 
is it really just an aesthetic thing for deciding how to how to blend and how much to blend? Right. I and mean, it's all true taste. Yeah. It's what I want to what I'm expecting coming out of it, what I want to come out of it. Sometimes it's way too tart and you blend it down with something that's not as tart to get that a smoother finish. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you want that ridiculous pucker factor coming out in your face. And that's like, all right, straight, that's what I want to do with that that barrel. That's perfect. I'm just going to do it with that. Um, I usually do two barrels of each just so I can have that ability to take one and blend it if I needed to with the other one if they are not at the same pace. Especially at our brewery, uh, two barrels are almost in the window. The other two are in the corner away. So the ones in the window definitely get a lot more heat coming in from the, the light. So those are usually take off a lot quicker. And you can definitely tell the sourness quicker in those two versus the ones that are against the wall. Um, back in the brewery where the other ones are, I don't have any problems with contamination because I keep everything clean before it goes into the fermenter. Everything's tight. Everything is um, caustic wash. Acid wash and uh, IO4 sanitized. Uh, everything's all the um, tubes are heat blasted to 180 degrees, if not hotter, um, before I bring it into it. So there's nothing in contact. Even though it's in my brewery, it's, and it might be in the line as I'm transfer or before I transfer. But before I transfer the beer, everything is heat sanitized to at least 180 degrees. Um, but. So it's all to taste when you, you're blending the beers. So I don't have any problem with cross-contamination with it just floating around in the air. Um, it's not going to change how the house beers are going to be. But I've never had the the old day oh. with the... Uh, you should uh, do that. Are you going to do that again this summer? Uh, we're brewing the amber next two weeks from now, actually. I'm going to have to make that green order. Um, but we're definitely going to do the uh, Berliner again. Um, it's an easy beer to make, yeah. and everybody seemed to enjoy it. Um, right now, we have um, Log Splitter, yes. which is our maple bourbon old ale, uh, which was on a homebrew winner. We also have our um, boysenberry wheat. Mix those two together, apparently it tastes like Dr. Pepper. <laughs> 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 Zolio to me is way too sweet. It's just, yeah, it was supposed to be sweet. Oh yeah, but I mean, yeah. for me, I just it's, it's, it's all that it's all that maple syrup that we added at the end. Yeah, it's just passed my palate. But if you mix it with what? Poisonberry. Um, <laughs> We're open till ten. <laughs> I was there last night, but okay. You can get them um, all in growlers. Yeah, you can get everything in growlers. No, no, I only have a uh, right now, the uh, Sour Pumpkin is on tap right now, so you can enjoy that, that first one that we have. Uh, we'll probably bring out Tennessee Wild again this fall. Um, we have some other ones this summer that I want to experiment with. But yeah. Tennessee Wild doesn't last long at all. Like, once words out that that's on tap, it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> which, is why <laughs> which is why I'm holding <laughs> on to it. <laughs> that's why I, keep, I, I never update the damn board. I see that. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, I've actually seen it on the board. I've seen it on the board. Email. Driven over there, and they were like, no, sorry. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh -oh. you should, you should put a date on the bottom there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Never updated. Um, <laughs> one question on fruit land mix. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to make my sweet framboise. Mm -hmm. um, wow. But I want it to be pretty funky, so I'm going to do. The front lamb gets um, after primary fermentation. Secondary goes in, start fermentation, hits the fruit. Mm -hmm. Fruit staying the whole time. Mm -hmm. Okay, let it eat it all. Mm -hmm. it's and it still retains the sweetness uh, flavor to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I didn't add any extract or any additional fruit to it afterwards. That's another thing about the taste. You, once you get that sourness to it, and mm -hmm. you, you see how much it's eating away. It can eat all that fruit character away completely. Yeah, but fruit don't. Don't disturb the pellet. You can go in there gently. <laughs> Don't like stir it up. I'm not gonna go there with that one, but yeah. <laughs> you, you're going in with your wine thief. You're you're going in on the side, gently going okay, into it. So you're not stirring the whole thing up on the top because yeah, that pellet on the top is actually protecting the beer. Is what it's designed to do. That is, that is, there is truth to that. Leave leave the pellet alone. I don't mess with it. I don't want to drink it. Oh, I don't want to drink it either. But I'm saying your, your stomach's gonna feel real good after drinking okay. that. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but there is truth to that. Like, you know, you don't need to go sample every day. No, uh, like every other month. Okay, cool. Nope. I'm trying to get all this in. 
in line with what I said. That's my next year's yeah. this hour. I wanted to wait for this class. Yeah, we, uh, I don't go in every day because it's not going to change day to day. No. Uh, you're going you're to see a change month to month. Um, you're, before Brett will even start to work, you're not going to even notice anything in the airlock about three to four weeks. So um, it's, you, you think it's not doing anything. You think it's bad. It's, it seriously takes a month before it actually does anything. But you definitely do a recommend primary to the secondary or just primary and walk away. If you're doing that blend that I talked about from White Labs, it has all yeah. five in one. Um, put it in and walk away. Um, if you're doing... If you're doing a regular house beer and then you add wet or your bugs to it afterwards, uh -huh. add it to the secondary, transfer it off. So that way you still have your house yeast that you're using. Um, fermenting in a, I know you said oxygen is key and plastic is porous. Um, primary bucket for two years? You can. No. You gotta make sure it's BPA, BPE free. Oh, I mean like yeah. a legit, like fermenter bucket. Yes. Um, but that is, it's cool to do that. Is yeah. it, there's not too much head space? No. Sweet. You want oxygen. Yeah. It needs oxygen to, to grow. Right. I just didn't know if there was a point of no return. Yeah. yeah. The, the cool thing about the cool thing about doing it in glass, you can actually see it happening, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty cool in general, just to see. Yeah, especially if you've never seen a pellicle, then you're like, what? <laughs> what the <laughs> hell is that? <laughs> Oh my god, it's looking at me. It just went. Yeah. <laughs> right. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Yeah, I'll be around for the next hour. Yeah. Bye. I'm here. Cool. Drink up. Um, if you guys want more beers, I have on tap, I have a black IPA that is a uh, co brewer um, made uh, for All Grain Day. It's. Um, Bonsai, Bonsai Black IPA. Bonsai Black IPA. Mm -hmm. um, we made ten gallons, but why have ten gallons of the same thing when you can have five gallons of two different things? So we uh, pitched uh, USO five, uh, which is Chico, basically American ale yeast, uh, and the other one we have a new strain from uh, Safale. It is their <clears throat> Abbey Ale strain, which is like a monastery ale yeast. Mm -hmm. um, there is distinct differences. Uh, I honestly find, I, as many know, I'm not huge into Belgians. I find the Belgian strain um, mutes a lot of the typical IPA flavors you would get, whereas the American one is very sharp. The hops are, hey, that's a black IPA. Whereas the Belgian <laughs> one's like, hey, that's, I don't really know what that is. Um, I definitely recommend if you're going to try and try both together. Um, we also are, have a double IPA. I don't know how much is left. It's delicious. Our we batch of all, I will punch you. <laughs> um, uh, no, it's actually really, really good. Uh, I have a dirty banana beer, um, which is chocolate, uh, red peppers, and it gets banana characteristics from the wheat yeast we use. I have AZ Brown, which I did something wrong because it's now AZ Amber. <laughs> um, my bad. He didn't make a bad beer. He just got changed the name. That's right. Yeah. Hey, it works for certain breweries. Yeah. Dark Irish, right? Um, but not Jimmy Dawson. Um, but also, you guys had the ginger saison. If there's any more of the sour beers up there, Finish they're them. all gone because I'm bringing them. No. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there you go, guys. Uh, any questions? I guess you're hanging out. Yeah, I'll hang out for the next 45 minutes or so. Cool. Oh, <clears throat> shit about sour. Uh, yeah. The bonsai black yeah. IPA. We're having it on tap. Um, this Friday coming up, it'll be on top of the brewery. So, we should definitely recommend if you guys, um, if you haven't been to Third Wave, you're missing out. Uh, right now, is it 14 on 14 tap? on tap. Do you want to wow. this weekend? No, not this weekend.